You graduated from the Flora Stone Mather College in June 1949 and then attended the Western Reserve University Graduate School, graduating with a Master's of Arts in 1951. What do you remember about how women were perceived during this time? Well, we were very fortunate to have a women's college. I always felt as a student here that things were pretty good because we had our own deans, we had our own faculty, and I thought everything was pretty rosy. <laughs> Could be wrong, but... So you returned to continue in physical education. Right. What were the opportunities for women in sports? And what were the most frustrating restrictions? It was a dreadful time for women in sports and athletics. The only place for women in sports was through the AAU and the Olympics. If they could get on an Olympic team, that was great. I mean, we all can remember Babe Saharius. We had two girls who were pretty good sprinters. But the fact is, women had no place to go. And so when Title IX came, it was a revolution. And the men are still arguing about it. A questionnaire survey was developed, pre-tested, and distributed to every woman employed by the university to assess and review the status of women. I have to say that's a remarkable achievement alone. What were the most significant findings? Certainly the most dramatic was the number of women faculty. There were um, 135 full professors on the faculty at that time but only 18 were women. Women were hired at the lower ranks and kept there, some for 30 years or more. Full professors who were men earned between $20,000 and $29,000. Full professors who were women never earned more than $21,000. The disparagement was great and it hasn't changed very much, I have to add. Staff people were hired as secretaries who should have been administrative assistants, but kept down because the salaries could be kept down. President Tepfer, in all his good works, had wanted us to do something about this. Well, it only took 16 years to name a woman vice president. <laughs> and that was like fast action. I was quite excited about that, and I was so excited about it, I thought it was great to have the title, and I never asked for a raise, and I didn't get one either. And then I must add, since we've had such a dramatic seven years under Barbara Snyder, that um, it took 181 years <laughs> to name a woman president. The idea was there, but it took a long time, and I'm not sure we have solved the problem, but at least we're working on it. You were instrumental in helping to establish a professional center for women on campus in 2002, with the hiring of its first full-time director, Dr. Dorothy Miller. The Mather alum said, we'll put up the money if you will let us have a women's mm -hmm. center and name it for Flora Stone Mather. We needed a women's center. We needed this home for undergraduates, graduates, for women faculty. And with it, we hired the best person we could find mm -hmm. who has turned out to be a remarkable leader. I, I guess that's one of those places where, you know, I never know enough to shut up. I suggested to the Mather alums that we should have a matching gift. I said, why don't we raise a million dollars and put it with our money and that'll do something good. Mm -hmm. Well, then they, they said, that's a great idea and you be the chair. <laughs> so for the past five years, I have been the chair. We did raise the money. It took a lot of people, a lot of hard work, but it obviously was a cause worth doing. I was happy about that. I'm happy about where the Women's Center is going. I know that they're gonna have a nice home in the new Veal Center, 
and that'll be wonderful for them. Mm -hmm. They certainly don't have enough space now. And uh, that it can be a, a growing future. I'm not so familiar with centers for women at other places, mm -hmm. but I've been convinced that this was a good one and that we have attracted a wonderful new director. So sky's the limit, you know. I was grown up and had a family of my own before I realized the sacrifice that my mother had made to get me started in life. My father died when I was 12 and I was then an only child and my mother had to go to work again and she never let me know that we were poor or that we didn't have all that everybody else had. And then as I grew up, she instilled in me the idea that education was everything. She had to quit school to go to work in the fifth grade. And she worked the rest of her life, mainly. And when she left her job as the assistant director of planned giving at White Motor Company, it took five people to fill her shoes. When I retired, after a wonderful career, it took five people to take my job. I had a good home life and it paid off. And I just feel that I need to recognize that. Why do you think you were so willing to speak up for yourself and others when some women were not? Well, Lynn, have I ever been uh, quiet? Have I ever been not willing to say what I think? No. I mean, it's part of me. It's just the way I am. I think there are lots of strong-minded women. There are some who don't want to push themselves because they're afraid they will not be popular. Well, that never bothered me. What advice do you have for women entering fields previously dominated by men today? If you know what to do, do it. Don't sit around and wait for people to suggest to you what you can do. If you think you can do it, go for it. 